Okay. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Sorry about the delay getting started here. Um, as we look at grapholinguistics in the 21st century, I want to uh, briefly look back at one of the great linguistic discoveries of the second half of the 20th century, which was sign language. Uh, not that they existed, but that sign languages were actually language. So as uh, Kleeman Belugi said in a um, classic work, we did not begin by assuming that ASL, that is American Sign Language, had a grammar. Uh, but American Sign Language uh, turned out to be, in fact, a complexly structured language with a highly articulated grammar, a language that exhibits many of the fundamental properties linguists have posited for all languages. But the special forms in which such properties are manifested turn out to be primarily a function of the visual gestural mode. And based on uh, groundbreaking work such as uh, that, we now know and take for granted that sign languages are true languages with complex grammar and that there is modality specific expression of language and grammar. Another interesting point about sign languages is that uh, they're mostly learned later in childhood, not by toddlers at home, because most deaf children do not have deaf parents. So in that way, um, that's a similarity with writing to be on the lookout for in this talk. Um, and sign, the existence of signed languages is proof that the language faculty is amodal. Now, uh, moving ahead to the 21st century, we are now getting a uh, rising chorus of voices claiming that writing represents the third modality of language. And so, as Myers has said, an amodal capacity for grammar would not only explain sign languages, but would also predict that grammar should appear beyond both speech and sign, in other words, in writing. Or as Miletus has said, the similarities between language and writing are actually unsurprising, given that writing as one of three modalities of language, the others being spoken language and sign language, is language. And so, um, as a, as a result of seeing writing as a third modality of language, we've seen a lot of, uh, or increasing amount of uh, identification of phonology or correlates of phonology in writing. So we've seen graphic features, we've seen graphematic syllables, graphematic feet, and uh, the use of constraint-based theories to uh, represent writing. But I, uh, in this talk, I wanna talk about morphology. I'm not the first to say that there are um, uh, morphological correlates in writing. Uh, Primus has said that the modern Roman alphabet letters are made of syntact syntagmatically concatenated smaller units. Lo loosely speaking, they resemble morphemes rather than phonemes. And as Miletus has pointed out, graphemes are signs. Phonemes are not. So uh, graphemes and morphemes have something in common that they do not share with phonemes, no matter whether the graphemes uh, represent morphemes, uh, syllables, or phonemes. Uh, and so just quickly, I want to uh, review a couple of cases where others have identified morphology in writing. James Myers, in his book on the grammar of Chinese characters, identifies character morphology. So for example, the famous semantic phonological compounds of Chinese characters, he um, identifies as having morphological um, forms. So, uh, for example, the word mother in uh, Chinese ma is monomorphemic in the spoken language, but as a grapheme, it is um, bimorphemic, uh, composed of two parts. And uh, he identifies the semantic radical as being an affix or affix-like, and um, on the grounds that the affixes are bound or have and have reduced forms, uh, are closed class and uh, are semantically bleached. He also identifies compounds and reduplication in Chinese characters. Another uh, place where morphology has at least been uh, 
implicitly identified in writing is in the structure of Maya glyph blocks. Uh, Maya glyph blocks consist of a main sign, which we can call a stem, and affixes, which are traditionally known as affixes. Uh, so here's an example where the main sign is the syllable pa, and we have a postfix, a subfix, or another example where the main sign is the syllable le, and we have a uh, prefix and a superfix. Uh, and in these examples, we can see that the modality is influencing the morphology because we are in two dimensions here. And so we are allowed more different kinds of affixes. So we have superfixes as well as prefixes, and we have subfixes and postfixes. Unlike in speech, where we have a um, unidimensional and unidirectionally um, occurring signal and uh, where we have prefixes and suffixes, and maybe we have some infixes and circumfixes, but certainly no superfixes or subfixes. Now, um, I want to take this uh, idea of morphology in, in scripts and look at the Aksha-based scripts of South and Southeast Asia, taking Devanagari uh, as an example. So for those of you who are not familiar with these writing systems, the, um, the basic simplest uh, grapheme is, is a, a consonant followed by an inherent vowel, so in this case, sa. And to add other vowels, you add a dependent sign somewhere around that um, basic consonant. You can even add one to say there is no vowel. If the vowel does not follow, a consonant has its own sign. And if there are two sequential consonants, you can uh, squeeze signs together into form conjuncts. And those conjuncts themselves can have um, modifying vowels. So looking at this morphologically, we can take the consonants as being main signs or stems, and the vowels, at least when they're non-initial, which have been called diacritic sometimes or satellite vowels, we can see those as affixes. So looking at our example again, we see those uh, vowels written all around uh, the main sign. And again, we are in two dimensions. So we can use the full space around the consonant. We can call this inflectional morphology because the, the core um, value of the consonant is preserved throughout the paradigm. There is also what we could call derivational morphology, such as when a dot is added to uh, convert a k into a h. The consonant conjuncts we saw, uh, we can consider compounds. So here's a, a, a close-up of one of those compounds, where sa and ta are combined to form sta. And this is a right-headed compound. So the left member is weak and reduced, as we would expect in a right-headed compound. And the weak member has no inherent unmarked inflection, in other words, the uh, inherent vowel uh, does not occur on the weak member. We can also see um, Akshara graphic morphology, that's what the G stands for there, uh, in other Akshara-based scripts. So in Tamil, for example, we can also see circumfixes. So on the left there, you see ka, and on the right, k, uh, which is the a is formed uh, with a sign both to the left and the right of the ka. We can see a distinction between level one and level two affixes by how tightly bound the vowel is to the consonant. So again, we have ka and then ku, where the u is very tightly bound, um, and kai, where uh, it is not as tightly bound. We can also see left-headed compounds, which occur in Canada. So here's an example. If you combine ta and ya, the ya, uh, becomes reduced in form and size and subscripted uh, to get tia. And the inflection, the A occurs on the, um, the left, the head member, which is that little tiny twirl up at the top that you may not even have noticed. Now, I started with sign language. We've so far seen analogs of spoken morphology in writing. What about sign language morphology. 
Uh, sign languages relate words and lexical families like um, other languages, but concatenative affixation is rare in sign languages. And in fact, American Sign Language has only one affix. Instead, they have something that has been called ion morphs, which are incomplete lexical units that compose with other partially specified lexical elements to, to uh, form a complete sign. So what do I mean by this? Here is a uh, family of words in American Sign Language that all have to do uh, with the semantic class of social groups. And in these uh, set of words, family, class, team, and group, the movement of the hands is the same. The place of articulation of the sign is the same. The orientation of the hands is the same. But the hand configuration varies. So these words are related, but not in, uh, through either inflection or derivation. And you can have multiple dimensions, uh, and a word can be a member of multiple families. So here, for example, is mother and father, and they have the same hand configuration, movement, and orientation, but different place of articulation. Similarly, mother is a part of a family with grandmother, and uh, there they vary in movement. And mother is part of a family with girl, where they vary in hand uh, configuration. So a single word can belong to uh, multiple different families. So why the modality difference? Pulling out a couple of reasons that have been um, proposed uh, that are relevant here. The, there's a greater bandwidth of visual processing than auditory processing. Uh, but there is a relative slowness of manual articulators compared to oral articulators. So both of these um, uh, mean that the articulation of, of morphological units simultaneously, rather than by concatenation, is preferred in a visual and manual um, modality. And also we have all those um, learners that are not learning as toddlers, and so being able to guess the meaning of something based on uh, the family membership is very useful. So are there ion morphs in writing? Perhaps somewhat surprisingly, yes. Um, let's look at the family of scripts known as Canadian Aboriginal syllabics, uh, which were created in 1840 for the Korean Ojibwe languages. And they have been... Uh, the, the original script has been adapted and modified uh, many times into a family of scripts used for Algonquian, Athabascan, and Inuit languages in Canada. And I want to look specifically at uh, one of these scripts, which is known as carrier syllabics. These are all uh, tend to be called syllabics, even though they are not syllabaries. Um, this is an Athabascan language spoken in British Columbia. And this specific version of this uh, script was developed in 1885 and uh, known as frog feet in the carrier language. And it was uh, quite popular for a while, and then its use de declined in the 1920s. The principles on which the system uh, works is that uh, the main signs are uh, stand for CV sequences. However, the shape of the sign stands for the consonant. And the orientation of the sign, and sometimes some additions, such as a little line or a dot, uh, provide the vowel. And uh, they combine into a single um, sign. There are additional dimensions of relatedness and carrier. So uh, closing off the end of the sign turns a, an unaspirated consonant into an aspirated consonant and um, the closing it with a bent line or a, a little bit of a V-shape there makes it glottalized. There are also smaller signs that occur at the ends of syllables for syllable final consonants. And again, you see relationships. So this uh, U-shape stands for a nasal at the end of a consonant, uh, a syllable, and the orientation stands for the place of articulation. So what we see here is a system where the shape of the CV sign stands for the C. And the orientation, and sometimes some other things, uh, provide the information about the V. Uh, and 
in carrier syllabics, at least, there are additional relationships that we see between consonants, um, such as shown in the straight close and the bent close. So here we have multidimensional relationships between partially specified parameters that are simultaneously manifested. In other words, the graphic morphology of the Canadian Aboriginal syllabics are like ASL. There are, these are graphic ion morphs. And why might we be seeing this in writing? Well, uh, script, like sign, is visual and slowly produced. Uh, and then there is also the um, ease of learning part where uh, children learn writing later than they learn speech, similar to uh, when they learn sign language. And uh, carrier syllabics was considered by the community to be easier to learn than the Roman script. So to um, sum up, written symbols are signs like morphemes, whether they stand for morphemes, syllables, or phonemes. Graphic morphology has previously been identified in Chinese characters and Maya glyphs, and um, I'm claiming now that uh, we can also see it in the Akshara-based scripts and in Canadian Aboriginal syllabics. The modality of language influences the type of morphology it's going to have. And so we've seen that ASL, for example, has ion morphs rather than affixes. And um, Canadian Aboriginal syllabics also have what we, a, a kind of graphic morphology that we can say is analogous to the signed ion morphs. And if we see writing as the third modality of language, then we can better understand the full range of the human language uh, faculty and understand how modality influences the expression of grammar. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes. In sign languages, uh, there are some uh, um, inflectional information which is uh, expressed by no manual components, as to say for the yes person. Is there something uh, <coughs> interesting in this because they are simultaneous with the, uh, the hand gestures as a science, and the same. Uh, you you explain for the Aboriginal uh, systems or or for uh, <coughs> some uh, uh, other systems such as, such as Maya. It's true. <laughs> so th th there's this kind of simultaneity in a space which is not definitely linear, which is interesting according to me. That's right. And um, one thing I I um, didn't include is the. Uh, the simultaneous use of uh, facial gestures as well uh, in signs. And that can be an important aspect of a sign. The particular examples I used did not yeah. have um, that part, but the it, so called no manual features. <laughs> right. They did not have non manual features. But um, a fascinating thing then to explore would be. Um, whether the, there's a fundamental difference between non-manual features and manual features for this kind of uh, morphology and whether there's an analog to that in uh, writing. And that's an interesting um, place for further work. Maybe it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite interesting, intriguing topic to explore. Thank you. Any other question? There's, well, uh, there's some ha raised hands. Ah. Arvid, have you raised your hand? 
Yes, I was waiting for your permission, actually. Um, uh, fascinating, I have to say. Um, I, I'm just wondering, Amalia, where... Now, this might be jumping the gun or, you know, uh, I, or I might have misunderstood uh, things completely, but uh, I still like your, like your clarification. Um, I was wondering where um, consonant sounds that are denoted by so-called bound or secondary or diacritic or satellite forms, uh, where do they fit into your um, proposal of things like, you know, the Anuswara or the Visarga in, in Brahmic systems or the reduced size uh, symbols that, um, I don't know if you see them in, in carrier, but uh, definitely in Cree in syllabics. So on the one hand, they are, you know, you, you could call them, uh, affixes, so to speak, but on the other hand, they s denote consonants. So where do they fit into the overall picture? Right. That's a the very good point. And um, as, as you could see, I was going through these um, systems very, very, uh, at very surface level. Um, so one answer is there's a lot more to be done here. Uh, another answer, though, is that we haven't actually explored the full range of morphological types. So um, I, my sort of guess, gut guess, um, is that there'd be useful uh, way of, of looking at some of those as though they're clitics, uh, because they're then um, lexically, um, <laughs> Uh, the analogy is that they're lexically valid, or in other words, they're signs, they stand for something uh, of their own in the same way, but that they are um, reduced forms. You know, in, in, in spoken clitics, they're phonologically reduced. So um, I think we may be seeing something like that. Okay, uh, Daniel? Hi. Um, I just popped some words into the chat. Oh, by the way, great talk, and I really liked the um, um, <laughs> uh, very. So I just popped some words into the chat. Um, glimmer, glint, glisten. They share the gl onset. Snout, snuffle, sniff. Um, you get things like this also in Semitic roots. You know, pers, per, and so. Um, I, I wonder whether these are like ion morphs. And then also we got, you know, things like ception, reception, conception, flation, inflation, conflation. I, I'm, so I'm wondering about the whether we're getting um, an expansion of terminology, whether these, whether there could be more correspondences um, than a, a new term like ion morph suggests. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, on the one hand, yes, the glint, glisten, glimmer kinds of um, things that people really haven't known what to do with those sorts of, of lexical families have been proposed as being um, ion, actually ion morphs. And that um, in a way, understanding languages that work that way more thoroughly uh, is a good way of then coming back to the spoken languages and seeing these and, oh, maybe this is what we're seeing there rather than concatenative morphology. Um, but then the Semitic languages, I, um, in case of, of a question on this topic, I actually have another slide here. Uh, are ion morphs different from the kind of templatic morphology we see in Semitic languages? Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm taking this from um, Fernal de Napoli, who's the ones that propose the ion morphs. Um, arguably, they are different, although they are uh, certainly more similar than concatenative morphology, um, because one of the crucial things in um, templatic morphology is the ordering of the elements. And uh, in ASL and in uh, Canadian Aboriginal syllabics, the elements are not ordered. And that's um, potentially a crucial difference. Okay, but I understand what you're saying. I, I, the next thing in the templates, I was thinking more of what's been called the etymon in, um, in Semitic philology, where the first two consonants of a root 
um, give you a certain cluster of meanings as you vary the third consonant. So that, that's more the direction I was going. Uh, yeah, like the English glisten glimmer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, as I say, it, it has been proposed that actually these are um, more quite similar and that uh, looking at sign language actually helps helps us understand uh, that this is actually going on in spoken language as well. Uh, and so maybe we do want ion morphs as a, as a term, term um, but there's a place for them in spoken uh, language too, because these, these things tend to get mentioned in um, you know, introductory linguistics classes, and then we shrug and say, well, don't know what to do with that. <laughs> So maybe this is what we do with that. Great. I have a question from the audience. Uh, thank you so much. A very interesting talk and lots of food for thought. Um, this is the first time I've encountered the term iron morph. Um, so I'm working just with what you said. Um, but what you said implied that it is a term that was introduced for the purposes of describing and understanding sign languages. And I... I feel that that's very admirable because, of course, in linguistics, one tends to take speech as the primary and uses the terminology that has been unpacked for speech to apply to these other um, modal languages. And I wonder if um, this is more of a conceptual question. It's not meant as a critique, but if... Um, if there's a danger of simply applying that same term to writing um, and making the primary vehicle of language, sign language instead of speech, but still making positioning writing as secondary. Um, I, I, I was very taken by your analogy, but I, I wonder if it is simply analogy or, or if you um, think that it is really the same conceptual work. That's, that's a very good question. And there's sort of two elements to that is how much of it is the same and how much of it should we use the same words, even if it is or even if it isn't. Um, and I don't have any particular, um, you know, com intellectual commitment on that one. Uh, and that is why I, I put G morphology in, in various places in the slide to clarify that I was talking about graphic morphology. On the other hand, um, even if writing is a third modality of language, it is a secondary modality, unlike sign. So at some level, it may then be more appropriate to um, can talk as though signed and spoken languages are primary because they are. Um, it may also make sense to develop a, a different set of terminology to if for no other reason than to just keep it straight. When you say morphology, what do you, you know, uh, it gets confusing. And so uh, if somebody wants to go ahead and like propose a set of terms, I'd be thrilled. Because uh, I don't, in fact, have any particular uh, commitment on that topic. Okay, I, I have a last question. Um, you said that um, carrier syllabics have declined quite early. Yes. Was it for historical, social, political reasons, or was it because of the inherent structure of the system? Uh, so yeah, let, let, good let, question. Uh, let oh. me tell you why I'm asking this, because uh, your system has, this um, carrier syllabic system has absolute symmetry. So you mm -hmm. rotate mm -hmm. signs in all directions. And I'm wondering about the cognitive charge of reading. Because in, in typography, when we have symmetrics, symmetric characters, then we tend to break the symmetry by mm -hmm, all means. Mm -hmm. So has this something to do with the cognitive charge? That's a very, very interesting question. Um, and you wonder a bit if, if this writing system uh, had more, um, more development, more buy-in, more tradition of use, whether it would have developed asymmetries. Um, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but to the best of my knowledge, the use declined uh, for social reasons, you know, uh, people being schooled in English. And so then uh, they become familiar with the Roman alphabet. And so there's now a, a, a Roman system, which is what the examples were transliterated into. 
Uh, and so people learn another system because it's more useful in the larger world. Uh, so as far as I know, that's the main reason. Uh, but as I mentioned, it was considered very easy to learn, and there is still an interest in, um, in uh, you know, resurrecting its use. But of course, it's got an uphill battle because, you know, children have to learn English in school. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amalia. So Thank you. let us. <laughs>